here we go. Um, this is the, the Astro Observers for October 2020 Observing Highlights. And this is my highlights for this past October. And the first one, um, for, first night, uh, that's the problem with uh, this past October. Uh, we really didn't have many good nights. I mean, it was pretty poor. Usually here in the Northeast, you know, we usually have some really good skies in October, but, uh, you know, it just was not a, not a great uh, month for deep sky observing for certain. Um, this was uh, on 10 13 2020. And um, then that night, it was, uh, that was the one where it started off a lot of humidity, especially down low. In the, in the valleys and stuff uh, when I was driving up to the site. And uh, but fortunately, later at night, uh, it started drying up a bit and it started to get a little bit better. But yeah, I had my, uh, my Bresser uh, 8.2 inch F3.9 and with my old uh, Celestron go-to mount. And I always like, you know, I always have first view of something and you know, make sure that the scope is, is working fine, make sure that the mount is, is heading uh, towards its object. So you always go to something nice and bright, very familiar. And of course, you know, Dumbbell Nebula. It was actually a pretty, really good view uh, using just a, a 25 millimeter plossel. So then we got into the more serious observing. Um, one of my favorite planetaries, you know, NGC 7008 Cygnus. And you can see I really pumped the power up for this uh, for this object, and I didn't use a nebula filter. I just I just wanted to see what I could get out of it. And um, of, of this this uh, photograph, the, the brighter parts I could easily see. In fact, I could actually see the 14th magnitude central star, which was pretty cool. But I was actually seeing a lot of detail at this magnification. Probably should have popped a nebula filter in there to bring out some more nebula, but. You know, it really looked good even without a nebula filter. That blue gold double star that you see on the edge, um, I could tell with this aperture, there was a difference in, in color. But as far as the blue gold, I, it takes a lot more aperture to actually see that type of color because they're not real bright stars. But it was really a cool view anyway. Then, um, this is funny. Um, I have, a, I have this book here that I still have that my parents bought for me from Christmas in 1969. And it, was the, it was the Amateur Astronomer's Handbook by uh, James Murin. And it, it's a really nice detailed book for his time and like that. You know, chapter 21 starts going through the constellations. And it, of course, there's a lot about double star, especially back in this time, you know, deep sky was kind of like, you know, very fringe of, of uh, you know, because there wasn't a whole lot of people who had a lot of big telescopes like we have today. So double stars were really popular. And so back this time period, when I had a small telescope, you know, double stars were really cool. So I thought it'd be really cool to do a double star. So I did Lambda Aries and actually got a really nice view with the 12 millimeter 74 magnification. The primary star has a, a nice pale yellow to it. And the secondary star is a pale, pale blue. And the color contrast is really nice. And I thought at this magnification that the, the separation was just kind of perfect to keep that color, uh, the color contrast between the two. So it was really a cool view, but brought back a lot of memories of being a kid going, you know, doing the double stars. And I want to do more double stars and you'll see me doing more double stars. Let me go to galaxies, of course. Um, and this is a really cool galaxy, uh, 7814 in Pegasus. And uh, it's, you know, here I used just, just under 100 magnification. And here's my near view image of it. You know, a little sterile nucleus, nice bright, large core area. And you can see it, it kind of has extended a bit going from uh, uh, northwest to southeast. Um, now, if you look at photographs of this thing, this is the one that has, they call it like the mini sombrero. It has a real thin dark dark lane. Now, of course, this aperture can't see it, but uh, and again, into the 20 inch plus, I, I think on really good nights, you'd be able to see the, this really thin dark lane. Then um, had another night, and like I said, October this October this for 2020 was not very good, and so here a couple nights later on the 17th. Um, 
it was one of those nights where it started off not bad, okay, uh, but uh, it, the skies really deteriorated very quickly. Um, so it wasn't a, it wasn't really a, a, you know a night of seeing a whole lot. So I really only had one highlight, and uh, it, it was a little dumbbell. And um, you know this is a really nice course image from our buddy Frank. Um, and you can see a lot of structure and, and so on. And so I did a, a near view image of what I saw. And um, this is with a four millimeter. And with the telescope, with the camera corrector, it's a 330 magnification. And what I wanted to see also was, you, know, you can see some of this outer nebula like that. And I could see a little bit of it. Now, I think if I popped in a nebula filter, it might've been a little bit better, but it was really an actual pretty good view without the nebula filter. This is really an under underappreciated object uh, of the Messier list. Uh, you know, the, the the southwestern lobe is brighter, a little more dense, where the northeastern lobe is a little broader and more uh, kind of more diffuse. Uh, I didn't see a central star. A central star, I, I think, is like 15 and a half magnitude or something like that. But... Um, but it really was. I could see some variations throughout the nebula, which was really cool. Uh, this is, but this is a really, really cool object to, to observe. And uh, from from this point, uh, actually, the sky conditions started really going downhill. And it wasn't much longer after after I observed this that uh, we packed it in for the night. So, and that's it for me for the observing highlights. Um, you know, it's it's a shame because, like I said, usually October is one of our better observing nights. So, I mean, observing months, you know, but it just didn't turn out to have really a, a lot of good nights to observe. And like I said, I think it was just that one night that, that we really had. Uh, for you guys, I don't know how many how many nights you guys had out. I don't know. Rob? It was not a good month for me because uh, of all that I had going on. Um, I guess we had that one night up at Hawk Mountain, but I guess that was really the September dark might have been, uh, I guess it might have been the beginning of this dark window. I went up to, to Hawk Mountain with you and Chris. Was that this dark window? Yeah. Yeah. And that wasn't a bad night. That, that, that was the night I chased down that little planetary. Right, right. That's 6886. Right, right, uh, right. That was kind of fun. Right. Um, but um, no, actually, um, when I sh share with what I observed, um, it's kind of funny because it you kind of touched on something when you said uh, the object you were looking at um, brought back memories of when you were first starting out. Yeah. Well, when I was observing this dark window, it, um, I had two nights from my driveway um, after that Hawk Mountain night. And one was with the refractor and one was with um, the, my, um, uh, my dog. Do you have a picture of that? You wanna yeah, put we'll that up there? Share your screen. And we'll go to yours. Go from the beginning. There you go. Yeah, so that's, this is what I brought out um, on Saturday night, the um, 17th. I had been out a few nights earlier with the refractor and had a pretty good night. And actually, I was going to write up the, the um, observations uh, from the refractor because I had a pretty decent night for about an hour and a half or so, two hours. I mean, it wasn't great, but it was better than nothing, you know. Um, but... On Saturday night, I thought it was going to be clear for a few hours. Uh, that's what the um, forecast showed. But I got a late start going out. Uh, and then I just thought, you know, it reminded me about when I used to observe from home when I first started observing, um, observing from the deck or the driveway. Except now, instead of pulling out, at, you know, the 10 inch Orion or the 12 and a half inch Orion and star hopping around, I roll out this you know, JP Astrocraft 20 inch F3 uh, there. And it really, it's set up and ready to go. It's it's in the garage. So the mirror's pretty cool. It, it cooled down pretty quickly, but um, 
it was just like reminding me of like when I first started out and I was just kind of hanging out in the driveway by myself listening to the uh, screech owls and uh, you know whatever other sounds of the night there were. So I decided to um, do something a little different. I, I had to position my telescope away from um, my neighbor's lake because I never know what time it goes off. Sometimes it goes off early and sometimes you know, it can be on a long time. So I moved the telescope back and really the best part of the sky I had was um, low Andromeda and I decided to go in Cassiopeia just for the, just for the fun of it. Right. So if you want to go to the first uh, slide there, very first one I went to was um, is NGC 147. So my, my, my um, presentation isn't going to have a lot of detail to it because first of all, these are very faint galaxies, very low surface brightness galaxies. And it wasn't a great night. It was, it was okay, but it wasn't great. But there was just something fun to be standing in your driveway, looking at a dwarf satellite galaxy of the Andromeda galaxy and thinking like, who, there's nobody else on my street doing that. <laughs> you know, um, so that was kind of fun. And, and it's, not a, it's not a bad little galaxy for, for, you know, for a faint dwarf galaxy. But for me, it was just the fun of finding it and uh, uh, tracking, you know, uh, getting a decent view of it in the little window that I had. So I just decided to stay um, in, in Cassiopeia and go to the other um, dwarf galaxy, which you want to go to 185. 185 is brighter. It's not as bright in the eyepiece. I didn't do the um, uh, near view the way that you had it set up, but 185 is definitely brighter. So when you compare the two of them, 185 is much easier to find um, and it shows a little more detail. 147 is just very, very uh, faint. But I kind of liked 185 and um, the, the, the one thing that I didn't get to do um, because the sky uh, crapped out was I was trying to see if I could get both 185 and 147 in the same field of view. I think I can, uh, certainly under better conditions, uh, you know, it would need a lower power, but uh, I would need better transparency to do it. Um, but the other thing about these galaxies, if you look up the distances to them, like if you see here, the, the distance that I got off of, um, I think it was Sky Safari off of this was 2 million light years. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny when we always call Andromeda the closest, uh, outside of the large and small Magellanic clouds, we always think of the Andromeda galaxy as uh, the closest galaxy. But you've got these 185 and 147 that, um, depending on how accurate these distances are, could actually uh, just be a little closer. But they were fun to observe. And, and um, they're, they're, like I said, it's, it's not so much in the detail that you see, but it's just in, you know, kind of knowing that you're looking at these satellite galaxies of Andromeda, right. which is kind of cool. Now, if you go to the next one, um, oh, that's the double image. So that, I want to try that the next time um, I go out. And I want to try it um, from my driveway first, see if I can uh, get a clear enough night to pull those in. Um, but I stayed in Cassiopeia for this next one. And I don't know if you are familiar with this one, Carl, how many times you might have looked at this, but it's a really cool little galaxy. Yeah, it's, um, yeah I, I, it's in my, actually, it's in my newest galaxy log. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it was really cool. It really surprised me for how bright it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's very, very, very tight, compact right. uh, spiral galaxy. And it was just kind of cool looking at it, especially when you're jumping around, um, you know, with like the 147 and 185 being such low surface brightness. And then all of a sudden you pop into this guy and you know, I, I really want to get a, a good look at him under higher power right. just to kind of see if I can uh, tweak out some detail. There's some pretty good images online um, that 
that um, show how compact those spiral arms are, right. but a lot of them are washed out because I think it is so, the nucleus is so big right. that uh, it's really hard to um, see a lot of detail. Like if you were to blow up that image, that, that galaxy you would see, it's kind of washed out yep. a little bit. But I, I was observing just with my 10 and eight millimeter ethos. So I was at 152 and 190. Um, uh, power. So um, I, I, I could have gone a little higher. And then the last one, um, <laughs> this was kind of a, um, not a bust, but I mean, you want to talk about faint. This is a very, very low surface brightness galaxy. And the sky condition started to um, deteriorate. So I didn't get too much into this one. I've seen this before from DS2 and from the edge. And again, this is also a satellite galaxy of Andromeda. Uh, and, and those three, 147, 185, IC10 are all uh, part of the local group. So it's just kind of fun. It kind of gave me a sense of where I am, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the universe, really. Right. And it was just kind of fun. And, the, you know, the, these are ones that I could... Uh, Come, come back to, again, especially the 278 and the IC10. Yeah. I, I definitely would track those down again. Yeah. So I'm hoping for the November dark window. I know I said that in the September and the October that I would want to get up to darker skies, you know, um, and I'm hoping that if we can catch some warm weather uh, at the beginning of the November dark window that, um, you know, we can get up to DS Edge or Josh, even up to High Knob, but unless that's closed down now. But um, so anyway, that was that was my local from my driveway, bringing back old memories, um, um, observing. Oh, and, and just real fast, last thing on this IC10, Josh, you might be interested in this. I, I was really having a hard time picking it up, and I ended up even though I had my go-to on. It was so faint, I was having trouble seeing it. And the go-to started drifting a little bit. It was off just a little bit. And I ended up star hopping to this using the Sky Safari DSS images, yep. which, which I've had success doing that before. You can pick out some really good um, patterns uh, in those DSS photographs. And then I use that for star hopping and it worked, it worked really, really well. I mean, I was really amazed at how much I can follow the image, pick up the star images and just walk my way up and then boom, there was IC10. Once I knew where it was, I was able to pick it up. So anyway, I, I was actually just really happy to be out. It, it was only about two hours, but you know, it's like one of those things when you're out observing, it's just, it just gets your juices flowing. And even though you're not up at a really, you know, dark location, it's kind of gets you in the frame of mind for, I can't wait to get out the next time. So that's, that was my, that was my night, my big night out in Castia. Yeah, good. All right. All right. So I got three good nights out. Uh, October dark window, one at Blue Mountain Vista, one up at Hawk Mountain Overlook, and then another one out at High Knob Overlook. So I had a really good uh, spread of local, uh, fairly dark, and then really dark skies. And um, was able to knock off some pretty good stuff in the uh, faint outer edges. And that works good for... Uh, what I like to talk about in here, which is Josh's obscure universe. So all right. Let's see here. Can you guys see that? Not yet. Cool. All right. Yep. Josh's obscure universe. So in here, when we talk about M objects, they're MCG catalog. No Messiers allowed. <laughs> um, Want to get out uh, out on the edges of the universe where the stuff is dim, the faint fuzzies, 
uh, retina torture, I like to call it. And uh, fun part about that is, you know, it kind of goes back to what Rob was saying earlier about, you know, how many people are in their driveway looking at dwarf galaxies. I like to think that we've got this universe that's been above everybody's heads for all these years, and I may be one of the only people to actually ever look at and visually observe these objects. So one of my favorite constellations to play around in this time of year, although it's uh, um, not necessarily a, a winter time one per se, maybe, um, depending on how you approach your observing sessions, if you stay up all night or not, is Pegasus. And uh, got a, three galaxies or three objects here that I want to talk about. Um, in Pegasus. First is UGC 11838. And this is a really neat edge on. Now this is going to take some high power to pull this off. Um, 1.8 by 0 0.2. So it's very edge on. You're going to need dark and you're going to need transparent skies and, and some large aperture to hit this. Sits up on the edge of uh, Pegasus and Cygnus. So it places well overhead uh, from the northern hemisphere, and I just I like edge on galaxies. They're 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 easier to detect. I feel because they they offer you a sense of shape and size, so it's kind of easier to to know for sure that you're seeing them when you're observing the dim stuff, kind of out on the edge of what's easily observed. So fifteen point three magnitude. Um, it doesn't sound that dim but with the size of this, the surface brightness is rather low on it. So you're going to want clear, you're going to want dark, you're going to want transparent skies for sure. Um, 170 million light years. So it's kind of getting out there a little bit. Very thin, very edge on, easy to see that, that size and shape. So next pair of galaxies. Um, it's always nice when you get a pair. When you're working the, the dim stuff, it takes you a little while to find some of this. So it's nice to get two objects instead of just one. Um, what was interesting about these is they're a nice face-on, edge-on combo. So very aesthetically pleasing. Um, again, you're not just barely detecting it. Um, when you have the, the contrasting shapes, it uh, helps your, your eye and brain develop a good relationship to what you're seeing. Now, what's interesting, you notice they're both the same exact magnitude, and they're within 10 million light years of each other. So it's kind of a rather neat view, uh, both aesthetically and mathematically. 15.9 um, mag and 280 and 290 million light years, respectively. Again, these are in Pegasus, and you're going to want fairly decent power on these. It doesn't have to be super high power. Um, I actually used a 7 Pentex in my 25-inch F4, um, and I was able to get both of them in that same field of view to give you that nice edge-on, face-on combo. And, being, so, and yeah, being 10 million light years apart, definitely a, a, a true pair in a nice guy like we in the, in the Andromeda yeah. Galaxy, a little bit farther apart, but yeah, they're definitely a true pair. Yep. Yep. I was not able to detect any of the outer ring structure on the face on. Yeah. Just the, the main core and uh, the, the con condensed ring right around it. Right. But the, the fainter arms seen here, I was not able to pick up. But definitely the core and that, that dense area directly around it. And the edge on had real nice extension, real nice shape. So fun one in Pegasus, um, bordering right on 16th magnitude. Of course, it's kind of like the car dealer when they sell you a car for 9999999. Um, unfortunately, you don't get to say you hit 16th magnitude with this one, but <laughs> mm, pretty close. And Josh, so, where were these viewed from? Uh, these were viewed from High Knob. High Knob. High Knob Overlook. So you're, you're going to need um, decent skies for these as well to uh, – to pin them down when you start tapping into that close to that 16th magnitude you you need the big aperture and, and the the good skies so then this one here uh, here's our m object no messiers allowed um 
M plus five dash five four dash five eight. And this is uh, Galaxy and Pegasus as well. But what makes this a fun challenge and obscure is it is right next to a 7.9 magnitude star. So the challenge is to separate this galaxy from the star. Again, you're going to need very transparent skies. Um, you know, if you're observing a bright star on a night and the transparency is off a little bit, you kind of get that haloing effect around the stars. This is where good quality optic dark skies, transparent, crisp, clear, kind of cool night. This, this makes a neat view. Star has a very goldish hue to it. Um, so you get that little color pop next to that pale little galaxy. 15.35 mag. Again, it's not a uh, super dim, but the challenge that makes it obscure is its, its location to that star. And this one here, we're at 340 million light years away. So again, we're, we're starting to get out there. So it's a neat field of view um, as far as depth. You have your, your bright local star in your own galaxy, and then way out there behind that one little star, there's a whole other galaxy waiting for you. And uh, yeah, it's ask you, makes Josh, you wonder if something's hiding right behind some bright star that we always look at all the time. Right. <laughs> you know? I was going to ask you, you have any what magnification were you using to, to view this? Um, this object here, this I observed with my five Pentex, so, so it's up right around 500. 500. Yeah, yeah. So you're uh, you need you need a decent amount of power to to separate it out, but. The, the galaxy itself is not super bright, so you don't want to spread it out too much under local skies. So I think probably that medium power in that 500 range, get under some dark skies and, and you'll be able to separate it out. So Josh, how would you compare that to um, Mirox Ghost? <laughs> much, <laughs> much harder. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, didn't, I didn't mean for fine, like for seeing it, I meant like when you do find the galaxy, are you still seeing the star at the same time or at that magnification? Have you, have you blocked the star out? No, it, it's, it, it, um, it's still in there. Okay. It's still in there. Yep. Yeah. yeah so it's actually, it looks like a little closer than Mirax Ghost then. Yes. Yeah. To Mir you're right. To Mirac, you know. Yep. Like, yeah. Yep. Cool. So yeah, those are the, the challenges for, the obscure universe. Well, I'll try to get out of my drive my next dark window and get to some of these, <laughs> get, a, get a little further than 2 million light years away. Um, yeah. Yep. Sorry, I was such a homebody, this dark window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that stinks. Though. It, it, it just, well, we didn't have a lot of nights, you know, it, was, it just, just was uh, one of those kind of, uh, months that uh, like i said usually october is actually usually pretty good and uh it just uh, just wasn't a whole lot of nice to choose from yeah um, but yeah that's just the way it goes but hopefully uh november will uh will uh, give us a lot more nights 